Today, we're going to share with you three things the Bible teaches about speaking in tongues. Let's get started. Welcome back, everyone. And today we're going to be talking about speaking in tongues. But before we get started, please take a moment to support this channel by liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing, and hitting that notification bell. We're currently participating in an experiment to see if we can grow this channel to 1 million subscribers in just one year. We want to demonstrate to the world that we're capable of growing platforms that will focus on the study of God's word, the testimony of Jesus Christ, and the attempt to know what we believe and why we believe it. So please be a part of the journey. We want to break YouTube's algorithm and we want to demonstrate that there are Christians out there that are serious about their faith. Now today we're gonna to be talking about speaking in tongues and specifically the gift of speaking in tongues and three things we should all know about how the gift of speaking in tongues is supposed to operate within the church. Now, depending on what tradition or denomination you're a part of, you may have encountered the gift of speaking in tongues or you may have been around congregations that welcome the practice of speaking in tongues. This experience can be uh, very different and unique depending on what your background or what the context of the Christian community you are most familiar with. Uh, we want to bring some sort of biblical understanding to this and we want to help maybe those who are wrestling with whether or not they are participating or experiencing speaking in tongues. We want to bring clarity and understanding from a biblical perspective because it is easy to judge what we do by what we see. And that's not always the most accurate thing to do. So today we're gonna to focus on what scripture states. Now it's important to know that speaking in tongues or ecstatic experiences were not rare during the first century. In fact, Greek communities were very familiar with experiences of ecstasy or supernatural as they may define it, experiences. There are all sorts of things that they did to um, maybe have a supernatural as we would describe it in, in Christian terms, but an abnormal is what they would probably see it as experience. And they would credit these experiences to the gods or to some sort of ritualistic influence. And so we want to see here in scripture that speaking in tongues was actually more than just an ecstatic experience. It was a mode or a form of communicating information to audiences. In fact, the very first example of speaking in tongues is found in Acts chapter two, verse three, and verse seven through verse eight. In Acts chapter two, we find that the apostles and the first uh, believers are in Jerusalem waiting for the uh, infusion of the power of God through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this was something that was prophesied by Joel the prophet. And here we are, we're reading in Acts chapter two, the fulfillment of that prophecy as he uh, foretold it. Now, when we get to verse three, it shows that something that looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each one of those who were there in the upper room. Now in verse four, it shows that everyone that was in that room was filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues or as the New Living Translation uh, re refers to it, other languages, because these were actual languages that they were speaking. And we know this because in verse seven through verse eight, it says that the people there that heard these things were amazed because these people who were from Galilee were speaking in the native languages of those who were there. And then in verse 9 through verse 11, it shows you the different groups of people that were there hearing these tongues being spoken. Now, this very first occurrence of speaking in tongues is a template. It's a formula, if you will, of how speaking in tongues is supposed to happen within the congregation. Because when we read within the letters of Paul, particularly in 1 Corinthians, we find that this model seems to be the experience or the impression that he has upon his mind as he's directing the church in Corinth. Now, it's important for us to understand that the church in Corinth was filled with all sorts of gifts. And one of the most evident gifts and one of the probably the most uh, sought after gifts was the gift of speaking in tongue. And we could probably see the correlation between the church in Corinth wanting to have that gift that was present in the very first days of the church as a means of demonstrating the evident flow and presence of the Holy Spirit upon one's life. And Paul goes to great length to show that it's not so much about the gift, but it's about the fruit and the virtue that comes from a person rather than the acclaim to some sort of special gift 
one that is more important than the other. This was causing friction and division, and Paul goes to great length to try to diminish that friction and completely remove it so that the church would not be competing with one another. So when it comes to speaking in tongues, Paul gives three guidelines for speaking in tongues, and he and he's very clear on this, and, and I, I assume if we're going to take the Bible seriously, these three guidelines would be important to us as we monitor and, and question whether or not um, we are practicing or seeing this gift being used correctly. Now, we could be in a huge debate about whether the gifts of the Spirit have continued today. Um, I think the better question uh, is if they are continuing and if we are saying we are experiencing these gifts, how should they be experienced? Now, the first thing that Paul states is that the gift of speaking in tongues is not given to all believers. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 30, he says, do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown tongues? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown tongues? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way of life that is best of all. So here he's, you know, basically asking these probing questions. And then he answers the question. As the church in Corinth are competing between different gifts, he clearly states that individuals, not all believers, have the gift of speaking in tongues, and not all of them have the gift of interpretation, just like not all believers have the gift of healing or the gift of doing miracles. It's very clear that we all have different gifts that are used in different ways for the glory of God, but yet these gifts are provided by the same Spirit. So the idea is not for everyone to have the same gift, but everyone to have their unique gifts so that in their collection of gifts, there is a an efficient and a powerful move of the Holy Spirit among the congregation that edifies everyone who is involved. The second thing that Paul states is that speaking in tongues should be accommodated with interpretation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 27 through verse 28, he says, no more than two or three should speak in tongues. They must speak one at a time and someone must interpret what they say. But if no one is present who can interpret, they must be silent in your church meeting and speak in tongues to God privately. So here we have within this second kind of uh, principle, we have somewhat of a breakdown of different things that should be happening. First, he says that there should be no more than two or three people speaking in tongue. And then he states that when those individuals are speaking in tongue, they should be speaking in tongue one at a time because the idea is not just to have, again, a personal or even an emotional experience, but it is to hear what is being said so that someone can come behind them and actually interpret the things that were said in another language. So this means that whatever is being said should be a spoken language that can be interpreted by someone else so that the message that is being spoken and unknown to the community can be understood and heard and then received through the work of the Spirit. So when we think about some of the common occurrences of, of, of speaking in tongue where the entire church may be participating, and in some instances there are absolutely no uh, offering of interpretation, we find this actually violates what Paul says should be happening in the church meeting. Now lastly, Paul states that though speaking in tongues is an incredible and edifying gift of the community or for the community, he says that prophecy is actually better than speaking in tongue. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18 to verse 19. He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. But in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. You see here, the idea when we come together in meetings is to receive something that would edify everyone involved, not to personally take an opportunity to edify ourselves. And one of the things about the common participation in church community or church worship settings is that many people have become so selfish that they don't think about how they can contribute to the meeting so that those among them can be edified by the gifts that they have to provide to the community. We have become so involved in receiving that we've forgotten to give. So one of the reasons why Paul is saying this is because, yes, you can get into a mode of speaking in tongues and you can edify yourself, but essentially we are not there 
in the community to edify ourselves. We're there to bless someone else by participating and operating in our own gifting. And this is why he says, I'd rather speak five words of understanding and, and prophecy and provide things that are understandable to other people than to speak a thousand or 10,000 words in a language that no one knows and cannot benefit from. So really the parameters for speaking in tongues requires us to help to, to think through a mode and a process, an idea about how the worship meeting is actually supposed to operate. It takes us from going there to receive something to going to the worship meeting to give something. And when we think about that, then this idea of speaking in tongues that Paul lays out, it actually becomes all the more sensible. It's the most sensible way to actually operate within a within a community of believers. So friends, I hope this is helpful. These three things are guidelines that should help us think through what we're experiencing, what we're doing, and how we're doing it. And I think when we think through these things in this way, we'll find ourselves glorifying God more and more as we come together as believers. If something has been said to help you or encourage you, please take a moment to like, share, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell, because we'll be back tomorrow with another video that we hope will be edifying to you and will be a blessing on your spiritual walk with Christ. So as we continue this journey, we thank you for watching. But until next time, take care and God bless.